being the first person who is the substitute. Um, that's a, quite a, a big ask to live up to, and uh, I, I too am very sad that some of those people aren't here tonight, and I'm looking forward to the reconvened event, but equally looking forward to some of the other readers that we've got tonight. So um, what I'm going to do tonight in my slot is just chat a little bit to you about a pro project that I'm working on. So it's going to be a little bit more of a sort of presentational talk and informal chat about what I'm working on, but I will do a little bit of a reading at the end, um, which is based on some visual poetry, um, which I've developed into something just for tonight. So what I'm working on is a project that I'm calling Defasures, and it is a project that has come out of my ongoing interest in the impact of damage and repair on text and textiles and sort of how they react and respond similarly and differently to being damaged and to being repaired. And this word that I've coined, dephasia, to describe my project, is a compound of deface, fray, erase, aperture, suture, and any other word that sounds like it's caught up in that dephasia. And this project was inspired by a lecture that I went to, given by the London Metropolitan Archive on historical methods of book conservation, um, which I was signposted to do, thanks to Simon. And it was a fascinating lecture about how in the 19th century and the early 20th century, some of the methods that were used to conserve books actually really interfered with them um, as material objects and are now really discredited. Most of these methods involved some kind of stitching, um, perhaps stitching together a tear across the page or patching a tear or even infilling that tear with a scrap of fabric or paper. And the archivists in the audience were duly horrified by the idea that you would interfere with a book in this way to conserve it. But as a poet, I was really excited because these seem to me like wonderful strategies for engaging with the materiality of the book as an object. So that was the starting point for this series, which is really about using stitching and patching and filling to intervene in the material surface of the book. And the particular series that I want to talk about tonight is based on the book, the DSM-5, which I have here. Um, and this is a book that it causes some pretty strong feelings and reactions. Um, if you don't know it, it is a diagnostic manual relied on in the USA, but also used worldwide for diagnosing mental health disorders. It has been celebrated by some for its attempt to apply consistency of language and framework to diagnosis and criticised by others for over-medicalising certain conditions or excluding certain conditions or for perpetuating certain myths and inequalities and biases. My main interest, though, is the way that as a book, like other books of its kind, it seems to almost transcend its own materiality and to have an authority that seems almost universal. I mean, the Bible comes to mind, Shakespeare comes to mind. There are certain texts which seem to be bigger than the book in which they are contained, um, which is something which I'm interested in and have very mixed feelings about, and it seemed ripe for my own interventions. So what I wanted to do was to try and use my dephasia techniques to intervene at the surface of the language. One of the things that really struck me was this claim to almost universal authority almost replicated a similar feeling or sense around the kind of language that's used, that medical language, which again seems to claim an objectivity or a universality. So it seemed like the language in the book and the book itself was almost trying to resist being considered um, within a cultural or material context. So I'm seeking to highlight the fabric of the book itself and to open up alternative ways of reading it and making meaning for it. And so posing questions, if you like, about the medical model that it's using and almost the idea that behind the uh, disorders that are being diagnosed is some kind of pristine state of mental health that we are aspiring to, and which my dephasias, I hope, problematize or complicate. 
Now, unfortunately, I've only got the one copy. Um, it's really, it's become an object that has power for me. Um, I will just open up a couple of pages to show you, which you can see at the end more closely, but you might get a little bit of a sense from a distance. But then I'm going to read a couple of poems that I have extrapolated from these dephages. So here's a page that you can probably see even from a distance where I've intervened with some scraps of silk fabric. It's man-made silk, it's organza, and they're stitched over the page with gold thread. Um, and the, the tears in the page I created. Um, and the text I'm gonna read um, will be drawn from that page in particular. And then another example, um, again, you might just be able to see it, is where I've created a window in one page through to a page beneath. Um, and I have bound that window with gold thread. And that is resonant with some of those medieval practices of securing tears in manuscripts with, with stitching. And the use of fabrics like silk and gold, I'm, I'm hoping raise questions about the status of these dephages. This is not necessarily an attack on this book, it's an engagement with it. It could be those things to celebrate about this book, but I think there are also things to ask questions about. I think all the more because the states of being it attempts to diagnose are some of the most mysterious human states. And they're states that can be states of extreme suffering and alienation, but also of creativity um, and of insight and vision. So those are the questions I wanted to raise. So that's the book as object, and that's my project. So what I'm going to do is just read three very short poems that I've created from those dephagias, taking the text that was isolated by the dephagia and then reorganizing it into a poem. So they're found text poems um, I'm going to share with you. Dephagia DSM-5 phobia, consisting of text, organza and gold thread. Ample fears of S and the Ark may be reasonable in a context of snakes and objects resembling the form of snakes. Over many years of ruin, individuals have changed their living circumstances to avoid insects, moved to reside in an area devoid of animals, or ongoing refusal of related travel because 0% of flying is as much as possible. In fear, anxiety or avoidance, they tend to their feared situations and the fear of exposure. Dephagia DSM-5, Criterion B, consisting of text, organza and gold thread. After an enforced crash, Criterion B countries suffer a loss scape and severity rates of trauma at suicidal levels of being. Dephagia DSM-5 attack, whole cut in text to make window reinforced by gold thread. Panic, followed by fear and chronic worry about additional panic and heart attacks attributable to panic and going crazy from panic and a change of behaviour due to panic, and panic about lucky feelings. Thank you.